Yeah, so our hymn today is Amazing Grace. Uh, the normal way of singing it. But I also, I originally, John Newton wrote like 13 verses, and it's a poem about himself. We're not going to sing all 13. We, I added one that you probably don't know, though, just to give you a sense of like, the song is longer than I usually sing it. So we're going to sing five of the verses, and four of them are the common ones, and then the others are... Not usually so I'll read the entire thing when I get to talking through the hymn. But that said, let's sing Amazing Grace. I'm sure you know it. and just what he's saying. And yeah, past days are 
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. What's the uh, figure of speech he's using? Anybody know? He's describing sound as well. Well, it's... Yeah, what, what's the sound that he's hearing? Grace. Grace, yeah. It's a just juxtaposition or a... So you don't normally think of hearing grace, right? So, uh, but it, it makes it it's sweet. And obviously, grace the the main theological concept to Christianity. What what's the definition of grace? Just so we know as we're moving forward. Squirrel. Not really. <laughs> Drawing compassion from a higher place. Higher place being like a. Greater. All right. Higher moral ground or, or mercy undeserved. Yeah. Mercy undeserved, showing compassion from a higher authority uh, to a subordinate. Yeah, okay. And I, I like those. Yeah, the, the general churchy answer uh, unmerited favor, right. undeserved mercy. Uh, yeah, grace is not getting what you deserve. Uh, and I would even say that that's, that applies to when you get something bad that you don't do to bring upon yourself. That's still grace from God. Pain is a means of uh, bringing about sanctification and a me- measure of grace. Uh, most people don't think of it that way, but I do. Uh, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. What biblical story is he referencing? One of Clint's oh, favorites. Oh, 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 oh. Well, is it someone? No, it's the one way around. Was it the well, one where they called him in? Yeah. And said, were you even actually blind? Yeah, Jesus heals the blind man, and then the Pharisees call him in and call his parents in, and all he says is, look, all I know is I, I was blind, but now I see. Uh, who healed you? Jesus. Uh, even though they, he says, don't tell anybody that I healed you. But, uh, that's the biblical story he's referencing, this famous line. And then what theological concept is he talking about? I once was lost, but now I'm found. Okay, yeah, adopted into the, the fold of Christ. More generally speaking, or more directly speaking? Saved. Saved, yeah, salvation. Regeneration, the entire process of salvation. I saw one hanging on a tree in agonies and blood who fixed his languid eyes on me as near his cross I stood. What does languid mean? Languid means uh, sorrowful and passionate. Dis- usually it means like despairing, sort of. Uh, <coughs> think of something languid as being in agony. Uh, it doesn't languish. Exactly. So it's like uh, I'm in despair, but it's because you just sort of water. Mm-hmm. It's like I'm looking at you like I'm, I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this for you. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the context here for sure. Who's he talking about? Squirrel. Squirrel. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that one's that one's easy. Uh, Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. What does he mean by fear? Fear. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. What's his heart fearing? Possibly. And grace, my fear is relieved. What, what's he talking about? He taught him to fear for his salvation. Okay, so what, what did you say, Caleb, down here? More like death. Death? Fearing death? And More you said. Like hell, I guess. Okay. And what you were talking about? Well, fearing that, you know, as he said, so it's, it's same, same kind of thing. Salvation. And you said fearing God. Uh, which you could argue is kind of the same thing, since hell is a is given as a punishment from God. Uh, he created hell, just FYI. Uh, it's not like he's not in control of what goes on in hell. He, he is. Uh, so, yeah, I'd say both are, are correct. I, I lean towards more specifically he's talking about just the fear of God. It was grace that taught me to fear God, because in our natural state... Exactly. 
Like, I learned the fear of God because he is awesome, mighty, and powerful. And again, hell is included in that. Uh, but in grace, my fear is relieved. He learned of the love of God and the kindness of God that uh, relieves that fear. Uh, how precious did that grace appear when the hour I first believed? What's he reflecting on? Again. Salvation, yeah, the, the moment of salvation. Uh, the Lord hath promised good to me, his word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Uh, resurrection of the Holy Spirit. Resurrection of the Holy Spirit. Uh, definitely the, my hope secures. What hope is he securing? Securing the promise of resurrection. Yes. Uh, what verse might he be thinking of? What the, the Lord has promised good to me? Jeremiah. Okay, he might be thinking of that. What What else might he be thinking of that would be theologically accurate? The Lord has promised good to me. Yeah. Eternal. Yeah, that's that's that, that's probably the concept he has. But what verse is he thinking of? No. Where did God promise good to him? Somewhere in the Bible. <laughs> Somewhere in the Bible. Yeah, so if we're going with, with, he's thinking about the promise of eternal life. I mean, you just got like John 3.16. Sure. Uh, if he's thinking, I, and I think he's talking more about uh, general living the daily day, day-to-day life, good is, was promised to him, shield and portion to me. I'm thinking Romans 8, right? Uh, God works all things together for the good of those who love him who are called according to his purpose. I think that's a theologically accurate statement to say that God has promised good to me and he's expressing his own love for God. I I think that's that's fair. Uh, When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. What theological concept is he describing we're singing God's praises with him. Jerusalem. Right. New Jerusalem, resurrection, and eternity. And I love the way that puts it in perspective. We have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. What's he saying? We'll live forever. Yeah. It's going to go on forever. So when we started, however long we've been doing it, guess what? We've got just as many days doing it later after that point because it, it's eternal. Nice poetic way to put it. This is the whole poem. So listen and feel free to Google it. It's, that, that's how I found this, by the way. So quick Google search. You guys don't have it. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. In evil, long I took delight, unawed by shame or fear. Till a new object met my sight and stopped my wild career. I saw one hanging on a tree in agonies and blood who fixed his languid eyes on me as near his cross I stood. Sure, never till my latest breath can I forget that look. It seemed to change me with his death, though not a word I spoke. My conscience owned and felt the guilt and plunged me in despair. I saw my sins his blood has shed and helped to nail him there. Alas, I knew not what I did, but all my tears were vain. Where could my trembling soul be hid for the Lord I had slain? A second look he gave, which said, I freely all forgive this blood is for thy ransom paid. I die that thou, might, I die that thou mayest live. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. The Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Yes, when this flesh and heart shall fail and mortal life shall cease, I shall possess within the veil a life of joy and peace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow, the sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below shall be forever mine. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. So there's a whole section 
describing in more detail the conversion process that he went through of that poem. That is usually left out when we're singing because it's first person and all that. But, uh, to make a little bit more sense of that section of the poem, we we'll learn a little bit about John Newton. Does anybody know anything about John Newton already? All right. I, I've seen the movie Amazing Grace, but okay. Uh, so yeah, he's in there. Oh yeah. It wasn't yeah. just about John Newton. Yeah. It was mainly about William Wilberforce, though. Yeah. So. Are fake Newtons cooked in the hidden in any way? I don't oh, think so. That would be awesome. Cookies. <laughs> These guys are rebel. We got a three fig Newton eater. Uh, John Newton was born in Wapping, London, in 1725, the son of John Newton Sr., a shipmaster in Mediterranean service. In 1743, while going to visit friends, Newton was captured and pressed into the naval service by the Royal Navy. He became a midshipman aboard HMS Harwood. At one point, Newton tried to desert and was punished in front of the crew of 350. Stripped to the waist and tied to the grating, he received a flogging of eight dozen lashes and reduced to the rank of a common seaman. Hmm. You guys know what pressed means? You're pressed into the naval service. Of course. Drafted. Yeah, drafted. Pre back then, drafting was a little bit more uh, forceful. forceful, violent. There were press gangs who would literally just walk around the streets and just grab people and capture them and force them to go to the Navy right then and there. It's not like you got to, you know, go home and say goodbye to your loved ones and that sort of thing. It's, it was, we grab you and we put you on a ship and you can't go anywhere because you're out at sea. So uh, you're going to serve in the Navy. Uh, kind of paragraph. Following that disgrace and humiliation, Newton initially contemplated murdering the captain and committing suicide by throwing himself overboard. But later, Harwick en route to India he was transferred to Pegasus, a slave ship bound for West Africa. The ship carried goods to Africa and traded them for slaves to be shipped to the colonies in the Caribbean and North America. Newton did not get along with the crew of Pegasus. In 1745, they left him in West Africa with Amos Clow, a slave dealer, who made him a house slave. Newton later recounted this period as the time he was once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in West Africa. Early in 1748, he was rescued by a sea captain who had been asked by Newton's father to search for him and returned to England on the merchant ship Greyhound. During his 1748 voyage to England after his rescue, Newton had a spiritual conversion. The ship encountered a severe storm off the coast of Donegal, Ireland, and almost sank. Newton marked this experience as the beginning of his conversion to evangelical Christianity. He began to re read the Bible and other religious literature. By the time he reached Britain, he had accepted the doctrines of evangelical Christianity. The date was 10 March 1748, an anniversary he marked for the rest of his life. From that point on, he avoided profanity, gambling, and drinking. Although he continued to work in the slave trade, he had gained sympathy for the slaves during his time in Africa. He later said that his true conversion did not happen until some time later. I cannot consider myself to have been a believer in the full sense of the word until a considerable time afterwards. In 1750, Newton married his childhood sweetheart, Mary Catlett, in St. Margaret's Church, Rochester. From 1757 to 1790, he pursued the priesthood and rigorous education in the Christian faith, learning ancient languages and eventually attaining the degree Doctor of Divinity and the role of Anglican priest. As a priest, he befriended many in Parliament, including William Wilberforce, leader of the abolitionist campaign in England. Wilberforce credited Newton with being a strong spiritual influence on him who encouraged him to stay in the Parliament when he considered quitting and acted as a form of support during his abolition efforts. So... Long story short, Newton was a slave. He was a slave trader after being a slave, and he was ultimately involved in ending slavery in Europe. Uh, interesting little twist there. Newton published the hymn Amazing Grace in 1779, though he wrote it as a sermon illustration in 1773. To this day, it is widely, re widely regarded the most well-known hymn of all time, largely because of its memorable tune, powerful emotion, and simple but clear statement of the central doctrines of Christianity, among them the one mentioned by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2.8, we are saved by grace through faith, not by works of the law. 
So that is John Newton and Amazing Grace. Taken largely from Wikipedia articles on John Newton. Indeed. Usually what I do is I just copy and paste huge chunks of those paragraphs and then just edit and smooth them out with my own words. So not my work at all. <laughs> uh, definitely plagiarized and I would be uh, fined heavily if I profited at all from this in any way. <laughs> Now, a lot of people don't get how copyrights work. Yeah. So what movie are we watching? We're not actually watching a movie today. We are watching a few clips, though, to sort of... Can I show how to watch a movie? Yeah, we're doing our lesson how to watch a movie today. And anybody need a pen? Should we watch a movie next time then? And take notes? Possibly, I'd doubt for that. We can decide. We can watch a movie. We can actually watch a movie. Or we can mark, watch Anybody a movie else afterwards. Uh, do we have There's the handouts for how to watch a movie. You may want them today. I would I I think more than any other day this would be one where you, where taking notes would be helpful. So there's gonna be sections where we just discuss, and uh, it's nice to write down what we discussed. To, uh, I forgot to put my little logo on this one. Well, that take a pen. Anybody else need a pen? Yes, so far. Okay. So yes, today we are talking about how to watch a movie. Hey Cameron, could you grab me a bottle of water? My throat's already starting to itch, which is not a good sign. What do you want? Some water? I'll take it up to the bottle. Also, Cameron, you can close the blinds. So today we're talking about how to watch a movie, and obviously part of this is this is my opinion on how to watch a movie, but also it's, it's the opinion that I think is biblically based, informed by uh, reason, Christian thought, and other such things. And I think it's a good opinion to follow and have. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But this is, this is not a, uh, here's exactly what the Bible says on how to watch a movie because the Bible doesn't really say anything on how to watch a movie. Movies weren't really a thing back then. Uh, the closest thing they had were plays, and they didn't talk about it at all in the Bible, so we don't really have much to go on in that realm. So this is where we have to do our own theology, taking what the Bible says and trying to apply it correctly. And honestly, I didn't really take any Bible verses out to put in this PowerPoint presentation. We're talking more concepts that we as Bible-believing Christians would agree on and can probably think of support pretty readily uh, if we were to just give it a second. But here's the outline for the day. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about worldviews. We talked about it in here some. I know some haven't talked about worldviews with us. So talk about what a worldview is because worldviews are what make a movie. And then we're going to start talking about some of, the, some of the nerdier things, components of a movie, what, what goes into making a movie, how, how does it work? I, as somebody who wanted to be a filmmaker for a long time and had done a lot of amateur filmmaking, am interested in that sort of thing. But I want you guys to think about the components and everything that goes into making a movie because, because the people who made the movie did. And everything that they used to make the movie, they, they used for a reason. They, they rarely put something into a movie just because. So, we'll talk about that. Then we're going to talk about the questions to ask of a movie. How do you analyze a movie? How do you think through some of the things in a movie? And then we're going to practice it. We're going to watch two short films that you might have seen. They both kind of went viral at one point. And then we're going to watch one scene from Frasier uh, that, that I like. No. Uh, but uh, just a short clip from Frasier. But... Uh, 
anyway, the, the idea will be to practice it, and I'm curious to know what you guys think and say about that. So I want engagement on the discussion part when we get there, and I'll give some final thoughts. So that's where we're headed. Be with me on where we're headed. We'll go quick on the worldview stuff because I think it's pretty straightforward, and we've talked about it a lot in this group, and if you don't know much about worldviews and haven't thought about it, I would recommend going back and listening to some of the worldview episodes back in like the story of the Bible and that sort of thing. But what is a worldview, anyone? Can you offer possibly a definition? So I think it, a worldview is the set of beliefs by which each person, you know, subconsciously observes and interprets the world. That's that's pretty accurate. I I think that's a pretty good definition to work off of. We got like, in here. On, on what a worldview is. Uh, this is my personal definition. Thank you. Yeah, hold your applause. I, a worldview is a set of beliefs by which each person subconsciously observes and interprets the world. Uh, it's, it's how do you see the world? Christians see the world a certain way. Ideally, you see it through the lens of this book. You see it as one big unfolding story of which we are a part. Somewhere right around there is where we are in the story. Uh, Starts in a garden with the first man and the first woman and progresses toward a city in which the same plant that was in that garden resides in that city at the end. Uh, sorry for the double preposition there. Components of a worldview. How do, you, how do you break it down and think about it, though? Uh, everybody has a worldview. Everybody thinks about these things at some point in their lives. They think about God. They think about ethics and morality. They think about evil. They think about reality, knowledge, and truth. And everybody thinks something about these things. Even if your something is, I don't think that thing exists. Which many people today would say. They would argue that God, truth, and morality don't exist. Almost everyone recognizes that that one exists. There are, are very few uh, aponeros people, absence of evil. It doesn't, doesn't happen. Because evil is just so in your face, particularly in our current culture. Anybody remember a particular act of evil that occurred recently? That Vegas. 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 Uh, oh, Vegas. Man. Don't even have to elaborate very much. We all know what you're talking about, right? Jeremy was in Vegas when that happened. He was right down the street. Oh. Huh. Jared? Jeremy. 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 Uh, oh. But evil is obviously present. You have to explain it somehow. What is it? Is it some sort of eternally existing force that's equal and opposite to some good force that eternally exists? And they're constantly at war in the universe and will always be at war? That would be called dualism. That's like the Star Wars view of evil and good. Uh, the yin and the yang. The yin and the yang. They, they complement and balance each other. That's not the Christian view. The Christian view is that evil had a beginning and it will have an end. That sort of thing. I, I'm going to trust that you guys are thinking people and can think about these things and what you believe on each of them. What do you think about God, ethics, morality, evil, reality? Uh, how do you think about those things? And we're going to move on from that. But worldview is very much tied to how do you watch a movie because every movie has a worldview or the makers of that movie have a worldview. Side note, quick little thing about art. Is anybody here interested in art? Define it. You say art. Art. No. Uh, so music, paintings, uh, sculptures, movies. Uh, movies are art. Interested how? Like interested as in enjoy? Enjoy it, yeah. Or just like enjoy? Yeah, in, enjoy consuming it. Okay. Uh, More listening to it, watching it, seeing it. Uh, so every form of creation is art. Yeah, I think so. Uh, you, and usually, I, I would say art is, is a form of creation th that contains a message. Uh, that would be my, my rough definition of art. Matthew's uh, the art. I, I was on board with any form of creation. That's, that's, that's what I I know, I, uh, just personally, I see like, you know, movies and, like, not all movies, of course, because some movies are just meant for entertainment, they're not really art. Because to me, art is meant to mostly, is meant to inspire, and 
Okay. Well, historically, some some part sucks. I agree. I'm like, <laughs> 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 well, I, I'm going to put this out a little bit more because I want to hear more of you guys today. But, uh, I want to push back a little bit on two things you just said. Right. One is you said, to me, art is meant to inspire. Uh, That's what I think. Yeah, so, so does that mean that art is meant to inspire? Objectively, like art, if you didn't exist, would art still me be meant to inspire? No, <laughs> it is. I mean, no, it is. <laughs> art is if, I, if I didn't exist, well, to many other people, that's just perfect. Okay, so what you're saying is yes, an aspect of art is that it's meant to inspire. Well, what inspires is a different form. What is art without existence to admire? It? Is it still is art? Or, uh, or is it just uh, existence? Just a, a little bit of a pushback there on. on I would agree. Part of art's purpose is to inspire. Well, that's just it, it, the way you talk about well, it. Well, no, I'm saying like that. It seems like that, that's its main purpose usually, because you know every every artist you listen to, like you kind of read some of the things they've said, and usually that's their that's their main talking point is about inspiration. But are you saying if it doesn't inspire you, you wouldn't consider it art? No, no. no he's no. just saying it's its purpose. The main purpose of art is to inspire. I would agree with postmodern art. I think you might be a little bit anachronistic. If you go down through art throughout the centuries, the purpose of art has, or the main purpose of art has, has shifted. I like say, you look at the Renaissance, Egypt. the main purpose of art was to teach. Back in Egypt, it was meant to communicate. In Egypt, it was meant to communicate, yeah. So there, there are different purposes for art, and yeah. some of them have more prominence in different ages than others. So good. It's this is, a lot of it was also used think to push social agendas. <clears throat> Correct, yeah. Lots so of times it's used to... To, uh, to ins inspire towards action on a certain topic. Does that sound like memes today? Yes. I would say memes are a form of art today. Oh, goodness. Uh, Those are inspirational. <laughs> and so we're going to talk about what makes good art and what's bad art. Because I think that there is an objective way that you can measure that, or at least start to quantify it. When that measure it. We'll get there. But so. That's more broad, and we're going to talk a little bit about more specifically how does how do movies fit into that genre of art, and what makes it a good movie or a bad movie. And one of the ways is to talk about the components of a movie. So, uh, all movies are made up of of components, pieces, uh, different things come together to make a movie. To give you a few examples to get your brain working, uh, actors, directors, producers are components of a movie. Uh, lights, sound, uh, CGI are components of a movie. A script, a story with a story arc and a plot, these are components of a movie. The genre and tone are components of a movie. The, gen the general feeling that the, that the movie creates in the, in the viewer is a component of the movie. Something that they're putting into it or trying to get out of it. So the question, how, how do we organize all of these things? Uh, these components of a movie. And so I've given you a few that I came up with ways to, to organize the components of a movie. Example, creators and, and what is created. One, one way to organize all the components is to separate the creator of the art or the movie from the art or the movie that he creates. Uh, so writers, directors, producers, actors, musicians, people who are creating and then what they create. Story, script, music, characters, plot, sound, uh, CGI effects. Uh, where this uh, organization method sort of leaves things out would be things like the inanimate object, like a light, a light fixture. Technically, the person who created that light fixture probably wasn't creating it for the movie or to communicate something in the movie or to contribute to the art. So that's this is where it trying to, to organize all these things, you're going to lose a few in your organization method, so I'm going to need a few. Uh, pieces in the whole would be another way you could try and organize these things in your mind. Pieces like actors, lights, scripts, characters, climax, cameras, versus the whole, the thing that it produces at the end. The, the story, the meaning, the message, and the lesson. The plot, the tone, the genre. These would be things that, that are described from the whole finished product as opposed to the pieces or components that make up that product. Uh, another way you might think about and organize these ideas would, would be in the production of a movie, pre-production, production, and post-production. 
kind of like blueprints the skeleton and then the finished product. Yeah. Pre-production would be script, story, genres, writers, producers, the guys who are coming up with the idea for how to make the movie but not yet making it. Production would be the things used in making the movie, lights, cameras, directors. Some of these would go in multiple categories, right? The actors or the writers might be involved in both pre-production and production. Uh, and then post-production, CGI, editing, the, the final story arc is determined in post-production. What do we cut? What do we keep? The tone usually is determined in post-production. Uh, how are we going to... What effects do we want to leave in the minds and hearts of our viewers? Another way that I thought of was actors, or active components versus passive components. This one picture sums up active and passive components nicely. What is the active component in this picture? It's a picture of a man holding a gun, and we, we assume he's, he looks sinister. He's in the act of, of doing a mass shooting. What's the active component? The man. The man. What's the passive component? The gun. The gun. Right. The gun is inanimate. It doesn't, it doesn't take action. It is acted upon. Or it is, it is acted with, but it, it doesn't take its own action. Whereas the man is the one who takes the action. He's, he's the active component. So this would be kind of translating the movie world. There are active components... Actors, writers, directors, story. Is this an active component or a passive component? This is like what you produce. So this, again, things falling through the cracks. Versus passive components. The lights, the cameras, the props, the CGI, the, the tools that you use to make the movie. You guys sort of with me on how I want you thinking? These are all the things that go into making a movie. Any other, what, which one of these do you like? How do you, how do you best like to... Uh, to categorize the components of a movie, what goes into it? Speak. N num number one. Number one. Creators and what's creative? I don't think any of them are wrong or any of them are right. I, I tend to agree. I think that the creators and what's created, I like that way of thinking about it. Uh, but there are things that fall through the cracks with that one. Any other thoughts or ideas of how to categorize the components of a movie? Or even have you even thought about the fact that all these components go into a movie? When you go to the theater, do you ever think, okay, who's in here? Who directed this? Uh, or do you ever walk out going, man, the lighting in there was just, like they, they used that well to make a point. Uh, <laughs> no. See, this is where, where film nerds like myself. This, that's what I'm doing all the time. I'm walking out, like Blade Runner. Hated that movie overall, but they did awesome stuff with lighting. Uh, Dark Knight, same thing. Christopher Nolan is better with lighting than any other director currently making movies. He just knows how to cast a shadow uh, on a screen to make a point. And you can see it in certain scenes in The Dark Knight where it's just like, oh, he did that on purpose. Like, that's, there's symbolism right there, and he's using his lights to work for it. Uh, I'll catch a little bit of symbolism, but I mostly just sit and watch the movies and enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> so here's the thing. The people making the movie are making those choices intentionally. They're the, the crazy people like me well, not like me who's gone, gone to film school, but they've gone to film school probably, and they've been taught every single component is there for a purpose, and you're using it to, to communicate something. Uh, example, a uh, movie that I hate is uh, the Bourne movies, the, the whole trilogy. I hate those movies for one reason, and it's a stylistic choice. It's the shaky cam. The whole movie, they're pretty much never using a tripod. It's always like a guy, and you, the, the camera's shaking all around, and it's, spo it's supposed to give you that feeling of being in the action, right? All those fight scenes, the throwing punches, and the camera's just like jumping all over the place. It's really hard to watch. Yeah. Gives me a headache. I don't like the movie for that reason. But it was an intentional choice by the director. He was trying to, to elicit an emotion from his audience and make you feel like you're part of the action. Right? These things are always happening in movies. The directors and the producers and the cinematographers are thinking about these things, even if you're not. And the good ones, like, like you've expressed, 
communicate the ideas without realize without you realizing that they communicated it. They're trying to implant their message in your brain without you realizing that they did it. That's what makes a good movie. You walk out of there and you think you just have an emotional reaction or you walk out thinking about one particular thing and you don't really know why. You just know that that's what you got out of the movie. Uh, if you can walk out of there and there's like, see that scene where he said this and then the, the camera switched over and was close up on this guy's face. <laughs> and I just started thinking of a John Mulaney sketch in my mind. But, uh, but if you can break down the components, usually that's, that's a sign that it's a bad movie or not well done. Right? Uh, these are things that I think you should be thinking about when you're watching a movie. You should be looking for the components. Uh, first of all, certain components are always present. Any movie. There's going to be a certain components that are there. And these are the four that I came up with that are pretty always. If you have a movie, these four things are part of that movie. Writer, director, camera, message, and meaning. And the message or meaning might be, we have no message. This is just... Stu yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is just stupid comedy. Those are usually some of my favorite movies. But... Spinal Tap, yeah. <laughs> but even then, there's, there's, there's sub points, sub, sub plot points where... They're making a statement. They're trying to, they're doing something. Uh, they emphasize friendship a lot throughout the movie. Like, there you go. You, at the end, too. Yeah. The whole, the whole band reunites. You even have Ian back there with the, with the cricket bat at, at the end. Uh, and then the drummer. And then the drummer blows up, yeah. <laughs> 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 Uh, a thinking Christian takes notes of the note of the components in a movie that he's watching. This is a, a statement that I'm putting out there. I think that this is true. I think if you're if you're thinking and you're a Christian, you should be taking notes of the components of the movie that you're watching. <coughs> you should recognize when a point is being made, not just be sucked in. Take out the point, and so. With all that in mind, there are certain questions that every Christian should ask of a movie. And the main one to ask, the, the, the one that if you, if you don't walk away from anything with this lesson other than this, this is what I want you to get. What is the point, main idea, or message of this movie? Or you could replace art with that. Every form of art, writing, uh, music, painting, sculpture, every form of art has a point that the artist wanted to communicate, a main idea or a message. Preaching, same thing. This is what you learn in, in Preaching 101, is your sermon should have a main idea, and everything in your sermon should be supporting or pointing to that main idea. And a good sermon is one where you can walk away and in one sentence say, what was that sermon about? Oh yeah, it was about Christians should tithe 10% of their, their income. It, it may be a right, right point or a wrong point, but it had a point. And so I want you guys to develop the skill of... of Identifying the point. What is the main idea, the message, or the point of any art, or in this case, any movie that you consume? Be able to state that point in a single sentence. Make sure it, it is a complete sentence with a subject and a complement. Like a, a here's an example. Here's here's a form of art: newspaper writing. Uh, what's the main idea of this article without having re read it? Blew up. Yeah. You could even say, Hindenburg Blast kills 35 people. That's the main point of the article. Like, think of it as, as a newspaper title of an article. I was say, the blast was that one guy's fault. <laughs> yeah, Expl su subtitle, explosion blamed on this guy. So, uh, this is obviously internet uh, trolling, because that's not historically accurate. But, uh, Point is, you should you should be able to state what what the art is about in a single sentence. And if you think of it like, what's what's the the headline for this newspaper article, that this art form or or a newspaper article, what would be the headline? That's a good way to identify what's the main point, what's the reason for this art. Uh, also. When you're sitting around trying to think of, of the main idea of a, of a movie or an art form, try to be objective and put yourself in the place of the creator. What point are they trying to convey? Not 
not yet, what do I think about this point? Uh, just what point are they trying to make? So, uh, give you an example or practice with this. Do uh, you guys, you guys heard the song Shake It Off, yeah? Yes. Taylor Swift? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, I know we hate it, but but we know the song, right? <laughs> So we put your put it yourself to make sure that we all know it. put yourself in the place of Taylor Swift. What point? What main idea is she trying to communicate with that song? Shake off the haters, bro. With the Z. Shake off the haters, bro. With a Z. <laughs> all right, good. Yeah, I, I think that's. And what define what we mean by shake off? Don't listen to them. Get them off. Yeah. Don't listen to to the haters. So, in a in a complete single sentence, it might be the the point of shake it off is. Do not allow the detractors in your life to shape your perception of your life. Yeah? Point of action. This is what she's saying. Don't let it happen. Uh, what would, what would the, the point of this lesson be? How to watch a movie. How to watch a movie. Yeah. Uh, to give you... A, some, some things of how to, how to go about this process. D identifying the main idea, these are some other questions you can ask. Ask yourself, why was this movie made? And this kind of gets back to what we were talking about earlier. Was it made to inform, to inspire, to entertain, to lament? What was the main reason or purpose uh, that, that, that they made this piece of art? If it's to inform, it's going to have a different sort of feel, tone, than if it's to entertain. When you're watching Ken Burns' Civil War, great documentary, uh, but its purpose is to inform. So it feels very different when you're watching that movie than when you're watching Zoolander. <laughs> that, that one's to inform, yeah, too, about the world of modeling, but, but more so to entertain, even though you learn a lot about the world of modeling from that movie. Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty hilarious. Uh... Asking the worldview of the movie. What is this movie saying about the world, reality, morality? Uh, and starting to transition into, after you've identified the main point, start asking, is this main point correct? And how do you, what do you compare it to to figure out if this main point is correct or true? This one's easy. The Bible, yeah. <laughs> Source of revelation from God. Uh, we've talked, again, we've talked a lot in here about uh, truth. Where do you get it? Uh, I would argue that you get it from here. If it contradicts what's in here, it's wrong. Uh, so, the Bible. Transitioning away from the identifying the main idea and evaluating it, uh, asking questions of, is this good art? What makes good art? I would say what makes a movie good or what makes good art is if its form matches its function. Uh, do the components of the movie facilitate the message that it's, that it's producing? Right. Exam two, two examples to juxtapose this so you can get, get the idea. Uh, a horror movie making a statement about the nature of evil. Form matches function. Yeah? A horror movie is a good function to talk about evil because that's usually what horror movies are about. That's kind of the whole point of the genre is, look, evil on display, let's say something about the nature of evil. Form matches function there. Uh, one where form doesn't quite match function as well would be a Pixar movie about the Holocaust. Yeah. Right? Pixar movies are generally family-friendly, lighter, they're a little bit uh, funny and have, have a happy-go-lucky sort of uh, love one another sort of sort of tone. Holocaust is not really that sort of a story to tell. I would laugh at every joke and feel bad for it. Yeah. And Frank movie. You understand what I'm saying about, about form and function? Could somebody give me another example of like when form and function don't match what versus when they do? Um... Action movie. Uh, I'm talking about uh, Friends of Water. 
because the movie that came to mind was Minority Report. And in that movie, just every single ad is about this one brand of water. That's just what I remember. <laughs> okay, yeah. Whenever you see advertising in a movie and they don't do it well, right? It's just like it's like when you watch the Avengers movie. It's like, wow, everyone drives a Chevy. <laughs> like, who knew? Uh, so that would be an example where the components didn't facilitate the message very well. It was in your face, right? They drew attention to the components instead of drawing attention to the message. Yeah, or like the new Ghostbusters. Yeah. It's supposed <laughs> to be about, oh, we're all equal. Okay. <laughs> yeah, take, taking a, a well-established story and just changing the sexes of the, of the characters for no reason at all. Uh, like what they're about to do with Lord of the Flies. Which makes no sense. Makes no sense, exactly. Because little, bo little boys left on an island to themselves are going to behave slightly differently than little girls left on an island to themselves. It's just the reality of it. Not even slightly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> little girls are as tough as little boys. Yeah. They're tougher than little boys, didn't you hear? We're equal. <laughs> <laughs> Please say that in as sports of Frenchie. <laughs> <laughs> The, you, you understand where I'm going with, with form and function. This can sometimes be used intentionally. I'm going to make a movie whose form doesn't match its function to make a point. An example of that uh, recently, a movie that was terrible, and I do not recommend you watching, but uh, the Sausage Party, right? That animated movie that was incredibly sexually graphic and, and disgusting. But the whole point was like, ha, 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 we're, like, you, we're taking the normal form of a children's movie and making it like really, really adult. So they specifically mismatched form and function to make a point. Uh, sometimes that can be the message, is that your components are not facilitating the message. And so that is your message. Uh, these are things I want you thinking about when, you, when you're watching a movie. Finally... Uh, does this movie reflect reality? This is something that you as a Christian should always be asking. And this is kind of where, where, the, where the analysis ends with watching a movie. Is what, is what they're saying, is their message true? What, what I'm really getting at. Uh, are these characters true to life? Or if it doesn't match reality, if the characters are unrealistic, are they unrealistic for a purpose? This makes good art if they're true to life or if they're unrealistic for a purpose. Avengers being an example. Like the whole point is that they're superheroes, they're not normal people, so it works. Uh, whereas we've all seen movies with terrible actors or bad dialogue where the characters were not true to life. It's like nobody would actually respond that way. This is a bad movie. Oh, it takes strong silence. Yeah. When they run into the forest instead of seeing them. Yeah. Everybody with me? Things that I think you should be thinking about when you're watching a movie? Last one. Uh, what methods do the makers use to make their case? So after they've made their point, sit back and think, what are their supporting arguments? How are they doing it? Think back on what you've learned in English class, probably about uh, the, the three types of argument. It comes from Plato. Pathos, ethos, and logos. Anybody know those? It's a path to your heart. It's the, the logic, and then it's the ethos is like appealing to your ethics. I don't remember right. what logos is. So, yeah, emotion, et morality, and logic. Those are the three ways to make an argument. What? Uh, for whatever reason, pathos just sounds like it should be. Yeah, same root word. Uh, but those, those, are the, those are the three types of arguments you can make. You can make a moral argument, as in we're going to argue that morality itself dictates you should behave that way. That should always yield the question, where did the morality come from? Just FYI. Uh, but... There was like this whole debate thing, and in every single one of my comments, I made sure I said, yes, morality exists if you accept free will. Because if you reject free will, then you reject morality. You sound like Ben Shapiro. <laughs> yeah. Uh, pathos would be the emotional arguments, emotional appeals. You guys have heard these, yes? Whenever you watch the SPCA movies, where Sarah McLaughlin comes on, in the arms of the angel. And then you see all of the, the dogs, with they're obviously frowning somehow into the camera. The big eyes, they're like, adopt me or they're going to slaughter us all. 
This is an emotional appeal. <laughs> this is this is not a logical appeal, right? It's it's tugging on the heartstrings. I don't know. I never felt anything. Else <laughs> Uh, yeah, sometimes the pathos arguments fall flat. Uh, logos would be the ones built on logical reasons. Those are usually the ones that get accused of being heartless. Uh, I'm, I'm well versed with being accused of being heartless. <laughs> I, I think those are the best arguments. The ones based on logic and the ones based on, based on morality, ethics, and I think that the emotional arguments usually detract from an argument instead of adding to it, but should not be completely ignored. They should be recognized and appropriately placed into a box. Uh, anyway. Music, pictures, characters. What are These are some of the other ways that they're supporting their argument. Does the character behave a certain way that, that elicits a certain response or makes a certain point? We're going to see an example of, of that, a couple examples, I think. Lighting, sound, camera ang angles. Again, those are the things that more that the film, film school nerds would recognize more than regular people. But I think it's something that worth training your eye to look for. Uh, example of one, so you guys remember the Dark, dark Knight? Uh, in that scene when uh, Harvey, or uh, Batman's standing on the roof with Harvey Dent and Commissioner Gordon, and they're doing that circle shot. You remember that? They're having this whole conversation going back and forth, uh, the three of them, and the camera is circling around the outside of them as they're talking. And so the dialogue usually lines up to whoever's facing the camera is the one speaking. But it's this really cool scene, one single shot, it's circling around them. And the effect is, is kind of like what the camera is doing. You're, you're listening to this, uh, this can, can we get a prosecutor? Yes, we can. She, can she do it? No. Batman, can you get the evidence? And they're going back and forth. And it, it creates this sort of like swirling sort of, uh, it's building sort of effect. The way that the camera is swirling and building. Uh, it builds, creates tension. As opposed to instead of just having stationary shots where we cut to the person talking, it's less active. It's, it, it stirs up the, the viewer less than seeing this moving shot while they're talking. That sort of stuff usually goes unnoticed, but is there to make a point. It's there to do something to the viewer. Would you watch that scene? Yeah, I just thought of it on the spot. Otherwise, I would have included it. Uh, but. You can probably find it on YouTube. Yeah, we can do that at the end. I think I got time for everything that I wanted to do. We're going to practice on two short films and a, and a scene from Frasier. So, uh, I want you all to watch these two short films and answer these four questions. So you have your sheet. This is the third page. This is where you're going to probably want to pen. Uh, let me make sure if my sound is working. Hey, Cameron. Yeah, you should turn down the lights. Um, hey Jerry, you want to turn down less? You know how to do the sliders so they'll go all the way off so people can still see to right? This one, this way? I think so. No. So this first short film is called The Present. It's a short film produced by Jacob Frey. Ideally, whenever you're watching a movie, it's good to know something about the people who made the movie. Uh, so if you're going to see a movie made by a particular, particular director or producer or written by a particular writer, knowing something about their worldview helps you to analyze the film that you're watching. But, uh, all you know right now is this guy's name. And so part of the, this exercise is Ideally, also, after having watched a piece of art, you should be able to tell something about the person who made the art. Maybe tell a little bit about what his worldview is. Uh, so this is a short film called The Present. Oh, I've seen this one before. Yeah, and I'm going to go just load it. It's very moving. Yeah, it's not working it's quite right. That was a stylistic choice. Yeah. Right? <laughs> if that were working correctly, it would have been. Uh, oh, sorry. Wrong one. 
Thomas here. Maybe it's just because of how it downloaded. Okay, sorry, we're gonna have to go watch it online. It's on YouTube. Yeah. Also, your computer seems to be kind of freezing up and going glitchy. I think you're right, it's thick as my computer. Let's try disconnecting and reconnecting. The flash, that's a pretty good show. It's pretty good. Where did you finish the season? There we go. Let's go. One sentence. What's the creator's message point? Being disabled is hard. Okay. 
very possible. I think that's a, that's a good starting place. So uh, let's uh, maybe let's hold off on that question and, and talk about some of the components we saw, and then see how the components add up to to make a, a point or a message. Uh, what are some of the components you saw? Both the dog and the boy were missing a lot of pathos. There you go. There's a pathos thing of argument. There's both the dog and the boy are missing a limb. That's definitely a component of the story. Sorry. Uh, climax would be when you stand up and see the boy is missing a leg also. Right? What are some other components you saw? Lighting. Lighting. There was lighting, right? In the beginning, it's dark. There's war sounds going on. And then she opens a, a window, opens a, the shades to a window. And I don't know, on that note, at the end, there's a lot of credits. What's standing open? The door. The door, right? Symbolism there, right? The door is is open now as opposed to closed, shut in. Uh, he's more free. Uh, what else did you see? There is a giraffe. Good observation. It's a component. That's a big nice switch. Two wildly different, uh, I guess, perspectives or um, attitudes towards their circumstances. There you go. So opposing sides. Attitudes towards circumstances. I think that you just touched on, on the main point of this, this movie. I, I would summarize it here and see if you can edit it or make it, make it a little bit better. I'm going to say that the main point of this movie was uh, your situation is only as bad as your outlook. And a better outlook uh, is, is, contains a brighter future than a, than a pessimistic outlook. Also, the people need companionship and something. There you go. Uh, uh, an aspect of companionship, friendship. People are meant to be in community. Someone yeah. or something can always affect you in a positive way, so as to change your negative outlook to a positive way. Good. All right. So someone or something can always change your outlook to be more positive. Uh, and the argument, obviously, is it's better. Yeah. Start start out. He's surly and, and frowning. At the end, he's smiling. So. <laughs> So and it's just like, what? <laughs> it's a regular thing, don't worry. <laughs> Another one is, uh, your mom always knows best. Yeah, your mom always knows best. These would be sub, sub points supporting the main point. Uh, what do you think is the creator's worldview? What does he think about God, ethics, morality, reality, truth, knowledge? I think those last three are more attainable from this short yeah. film. What does he think about reality? Oh, he thinks it's the positive if you look for it. That you can change your reality based on your attitude. Like, I would almost say the opposite. Well, really? So he's, he recognizes reality is what it is. Well, yeah, yeah, I was going to say, so so reality can be tough said, and reality is tough. That's why so, I said your reality, not... Yeah, so like, you're... Because the, the reality that you perceive. Like, that yeah. he, was, he was in a dark place, he was shut in from the world, and then he was brought out of it because of companions. Yeah. And so it's... The only thing that can change is your own perspective. Yeah. Not, not, the re, not the reality of the situation you're in. The reality that's, that's was constant. Constant. Yeah, good. Okay. Uh, yeah, I would agree. Uh, does the form match the function? Yes and no. It, it, it's a because it, on one hand, it um it is it look has more of a Pixar type of look, but it has deeper meaning than what you're used to. Right. Yeah. And this is something that's particularly common in short films. Uh, short films, particularly nowadays, are more often animated. One because it's cheaper to animate a short film than to film a short film, and two because you can make them do more fantastic things on a smaller budget uh, again cheaper but you can you can bring in more fantastic concepts and, and better symbolism in an animated film than you can with a with a live action film uh, what's the biblical analysis response to this film so we, we kind of identified the main point we could probably refine it further we have more time but the main point was something along the lines of uh, Positive people in your community change your outlook and is therefore better uh, in, in dire situations. Mm -hmm. 
Would you say that that's a that's a change your outlook um, and attitude towards your reality? Towards, towards your reality. reality. Doesn't even mean to while here, still just recognizing the truth. While still recognizing the truth. So would you say that, that is a that is a biblical point to be made? That that's a good and true point. As a, generally speaking, I, I can't. I don't yes. have any biblical evidence off the top of my head. But yeah. generally speaking, yes. I would say all positive things. On that. I would say yes. Generally speaking, yes. If the point that this creator is making is saying your perception shapes reality, then we as Christians would deny that. We'd say no. Reality is objective. All you can. The only thing that is shaped is your perception. Uh, the reality doesn't change. But I think that this guy was not saying that. Uh, good. All right. Here's another one. Another short film. Uh, let me know what you think of this one.
All right. What are some of the components you saw? What were some of the messages and themes? Well, that love is only something you feel for someone you're sexually attracted to. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay, so what well, I want to spe very specifically do, uh, we want to put our place in the put ourselves in the place of the creators of this film first. Accurately represent their point. What is their main point? Okay. At the end, we evaluate whether or not it's it's a true right or biblical point. All right. So, but let's so let's start with that. And I I agree, but let's let's keep the let's keep the the sarcasm out of it to to start with. Okay. So that some boys love other boys, and a lot of people don't like that. Okay. Uh, You're but if you go for it, and that other boy likes you, it's good. Don't be ashamed yeah. to follow your heart. There you go. Okay, don't be ashamed to follow your heart. It might your be one one way to. Control. Your feelings aren't something you can control. Uh, yeah, I think these are these are good stabs at what's what's the main point or the message. You can summarize it with the old adage: the heart wants what it wants. Uh, Whatever your heart wants is okay. Let's let's back up off of the main point and analyze some of the components to begin with. What what was what was the main sim like the symbolism was pretty blatant in this one. It wasn't as subtle. At, at the beginning, when he was walking by, he was he was throwing the apple and. It kind of symbolized that he was the apple of his eye. Mm, okay, good. And then threw up the apple and when he had the heart in his hand, he was holding his heart. Like. Yeah, holding his heart in his hand, right? The uh, Obviously, the, the blatant symbolism is this is a heart. It represents my love, my my emotions, my feelings towards someone else. The heart in this, this, this char the character of the heart is this very, very cute little thing, all dewy-eyed and... Uh, you know, tries to kiss him when he reaches out, tries to kiss him, right? brushes his hair. Uh, it's something that we as, when we get to the biblical end, we start looking at these components, and I want you to notice, all of the components of this are physical. For the heart. Right? All of the heart's things that it does are, are all about the physical. <laughs> uh, granted, it's a short film, you can't communicate everything, and they decided to make it a one with no dialogue. So, what component did they use very effectively in the background? Music. Music. If you'd watch that without the music going, with the slow piano, the violin playing when, when all the people are judging them, uh, don't have nearly the same emotional response. Right? Uh, objectively speaking, if you don't have the biblical grounding where you say there's something objectively wrong about a homosexual relationship, you just watch that film, it's very emotionally compelling. It's like, what's so wrong about this? It's just two people who like each other. One thing I found interesting is that if you took the two actual characters out of the equation, just showed the hearts like they did, mm -hmm. the hearts are very non-sex specific. <laughs> yeah. Like, they, they just look like little cartoon characters, like, well, love is love regardless of who you are. There you go. And so that... why put a boundary around? I feel like they were trying to get at something like that. And I would say that's probably the main point of this of this short film. The main point of the main idea is love is love. Uh, and it's physical. <laughs> yeah, and it's physical. <laughs> they probably don't intend that. It's just well, that's, it's that's just their worldview. That's because it's not explicit. Yeah. That's the worldview of the people who made this though, is love is, is intrinsically physical and sexual. So uh, those are the other, I mean, again, one of the pieces of symbolism where they're really using components to, uh, to get their point across. One, the music. Look at the lighting difference. Out uh, here, all it's of these so scenes. so dark with the other kids. Correct. Right? You come like in here. They're in the light. We hit sepia tones. No. We've got dark shadows. And when we see these kids, we've got the shading around the corners. They're all frowning. And, uh, and mm -hmm. camera angles in this one, too. Uh, you see the camera angle looking at these kids. If you were to looking imagine, where's the camera? Where's they're the camera? Down. Yeah, they're looking down. These people who are looking down on these other people. Also, the camera is lower to the ground when it's pinned. Uh, looking at them, I think that's to make you feel like on their level. level. They're probably feeling very small. Exactly. Uh, this is a this is a very common filmmaking technique, by the way. The the camera from the floor. Uh, First most effectively used in Orson Welles, uh, the the Rosebud movie. What what movie am I thinking of? Citizen Kane. 
uh, there's this famous scene where the Citizen Kane is this big guy and he uh, aggrandizes himself and has a political career and the whole movie is about how he is uh, he is such a powerful uh, intimidating man and he ends up being quite unintimidating at the end but at the t time when he's the most powerful and the, mo the most intimidating we've got this shot where the camera's right on the floor you can see everything the floorboard's up to him and the other person is standing here and he's just huge and you've got this this camera angle that is depicting that that reality. All uh, the noses are turned up. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't put that one too far because, uh, but but yes. Uh, and you guys have identified some of the main components, and you've done some pretty good biblical analysis right away of, of identifying what's wrong with them. The the faulty assumptions that they're making. One, uh, their definition of love. Love is not intrinsically physical. Uh, it, uh, there, there's more to this issue that they're clearly they're clearly addressing a particular social issue. Name it. Homosexuality. Homosexuality and culture. Uh, there's more to this issue than than gets depicted on this, and this is what's known as a straw man argument. Their argument is a straw man. Uh, there's more to a homosexual relationship than just feelings, uh, and they even, un, I think, unknowingly recognize that <laughs> that it's all built on physical everything that the, that the heart does everything that uh, that the boy does in relation to the other boy it's all about the physical it's not about uh, spiritual also until the very end when we're saying there's no spiritual difference what's wrong also it it's got two hearts that look the same yeah they didn't show any sort of you know bull up to you know like you know then actually talking and getting to know each other it was just this guy is stopping just another guy. Action. Yeah, and it's just following him. It's, it's just a peeping Tom, right? <laughs> it's a stalker. Back to the future. Yeah. Tom. It's just. Which I don't, I've never understood that about about most rom coms, right? It's this guy who loves this girl from afar and stalks her, and he's so adorable. <laughs> and what's the difference? The only difference seems to be between when he's adorable and when he's a creep is if the girl likes him or not. <laughs> or <if laughs> that seems to be it. Uh, if she well, thinks he's cute and willing to give him a chance. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, you guys did a good job. I, I want you guys, I'm, and I'm inclined to the same thing. You, you understood the message right away. We had to dig for some of the components, though. I want you to be able to identify the components that make up the message and show why those components might be built on faulty premises when, when you're... That makes your arguments more effective, and it makes you more effective at analyzing movies. Because sometimes you walk away from a movie going, "It's just something off about that. I can't quite identify it." But if you think about the components in that movie, you might identify it. You might be able to figure out why it made you feel or think a certain way. Yeah. What if we uh, set something up for like once every month we have a have a movie night? We actually all sit down and we analyze a movie. movie. I'd be down for that. I think would say, as I say to most of these suggestions, I will do my best to attend anything that you organize. <laughs> I'm not going to take it on myself to organize it and rally it, though, because whenever I do that, it tends to fall apart. I know what I'm good at, I'm good at teaching, so I stick to that. I will support you in whatever way I can in making that happen. So you guys want to make that happen, I'm on board. Talk to Caleb. Awesome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It, it, I, I don't want to do all that. <laughs> the last week of uh, October, we want to do it this month. Because mm -hmm. Peter and I are going to New Orleans for a Christmas wedding. That's, okay. that's one of those later planned yeah. things. Yeah. Last one, a scene from Frasier, uh, Key 536. I actually have to watch this Flower one. Flower Child. Yes, it's from the episode called Flower Child. <laughs> uh, I think I queued it up before we started. Let's see if it actually goes there. So there is one mildly inappropriate joke in here, so I apologize. Uh, I don't think it's, I, I ran it through my parent filter, I don't think it's bad enough that any parents would really strongly object, but just, uh, it's actually something that we can analyze though, so. Uh, what's happened so far, so to bring you up to date on where they are on the scene, they're, they're, the three, oh, you can't see this. 
the three characters in the in the cab, Martin, Frazier, and Niles, are, are taking a cab ride. They're stuck in traffic, and the cab driver goes into labor. And so uh, <laughs> Niles has been up front, and he fails at, at successfully delivering the baby. And so Frazier gets up front, and he just embarrasses himself and fails. And so Martin is about to get up front and, and help deliver the baby. <laughs> Just fine, sweetheart. Now, I've delivered more than a, a few babies in my lifetime, and some of them are even older than you are now. Now, Frazier's going to hold your hand and help you with your breathing, and Niles is going to look out for an ambulance, and I'm going to get ready to bring beautiful baby into this world, okay? Okay. Good. Now, are there any questions? Yes. Yeah. Our meter still be running. <laughs> <laughs> she can tell she's hurt. Hello? Are you back yet? This is the mildly inappropriate joke. Well, go on, turn your heads. <laughs> okay. So, I guess you have some excitement tonight. No, I haven't. <laughs> Father sure made it sound exciting on the phone. Delivering a baby in a taxi. Oh, that? I don't think of that as excitement as much as my sworn duty to use those skills I honed in medical school. Miss Niles ran down to a falafel stand for a pot of hot water. <laughs> <laughs> what I can't get over is that feeling of being there right when a person's life begins. One minute it's just this blob in some lady's stomach, next minute it's a person. Blob. Person. <laughs> Miracle of birth summed up in one poetic phrase. And I bet you have some fond memories of when your son was born. Oh, yes, of course. I remember the very first time I held him in my arms as a newborn. It was as if everything else in the universe simply melted away. There was just a father, a son, and the distant sound of Lilith saying, if you ever come near me again, Fraser, I'll drop you with a deer rifle. <laughs> okay, that was the scene I wanted to watch. All right, this one is a little exercise, a little bit different because we're not watching the whole episode. We're just watching a quick scene. But there's something in this scene that particular. There's two things really that stand out to me. One in particular that strikes me uh, as a biblical viewer. That that I'm wondering if it struck you. Anybody? Blob. There you go. Yeah. Right? It's a joke. One minute it's a blob in a person's stomach, next minute it's a person. Blob. Person. The miracle of life summed up in one poetic phrase, right? And it's funny, haha, <laughs> we laugh. That's that's the worldview that the makers of Fraser are trying to get you to accept. Right? textbook. <laughs> it's funny, right? Haha, <laughs> yeah, we all know life doesn't really begin until somebody comes out of the womb. Uh, sub point that they don't mention, and that they're probably, uh, I, I, I've read up on lots of the writers of Frasier, and 99% of them would say, oh yeah, this is totally fine, we can kill those things. Before they're a person, they're just a blob. <laughs> right? Uh, this is the kind of thing I want you to to be able to identify. This is the kind of thing that shapes worldviews and uh, without you realizing it. And that's, that's how worldviews are shaped. Worldviews are largely shaped by culture and by art, by the, the things that you consume uncritically. And so what you have to do is consume them critically. Think about what you're watching. Think about what you're listening to, seeing, and ask yourself, is this true? Uh, Get out of that. Here. The other mild note that uh, is really all throughout Frasier, it's, it's the idea that uh, Niles is, is uh, the character who you know turned around and then turned back around to walk, try and watch her undress, and Frasier turned him around again. All throughout the first seven seasons of Frasier, he's, he's leering at Daphne and fantasizing about her sexually from afar. And... Uh, and then, uh, 
gets a divorce from his current wife in order to marry her. Uh, and all of this is romantic and good because they're meant to be together because he loves her so much. Well, actually, Niles went through two different women to get to Daphne. He had an unhealthy attraction to her for a long time. It's completely physical. And uh, there's no problem with this? No, we all just like the characters and we just get along. And they let everything go along until they were about, until Daphne was about to get married. Yeah. <laughs> and then just left everyone. Yeah. For the sake of drama, it's, you know, it's good television. It's horrible morality. Uh, and it's just presented as reality. This is okay because they really like each other. Well, that's not that's not a good enough excuse. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, some final thoughts, questions that that are tangentially related. I thought about de de devoting more time to, but I thought, no, we'll just get off track to do that. So I put them at the end. Actually, I'll go to this one first, and we'll come back to those questions because we're nearly out of time anyway. But. Should I watch this movie? So a lot of times, particularly in the development stages of life in Christianity, you should, you're asking these questions of, of is, should I be watching this? Things like, should I be watching an R-rated movie? Should I be listening to explicit music? Is it right or wrong for Christians to do that? If they do that, am I sinning? Uh, these are questions that are very common, I think. And so I, I think this is a good general rule to go by. This is a good test. This is not straight out of the Bible, uh, but... I, I think it's wise. So the, the question is this. You ask yourself this series of questions. They should all have question marks even though they all have periods. But Does this movie weaken my reason, impair the tenderness of my conscience, obscure my sight of God, diminish my thirst for spiritual things, or increase the authority of my body over my mind? If you answer yes to any of those five questions, you probably should not consume or watch this movie. And it applies to all art. Should I listen to this music? Should I view this painting? Uh, I think if you if you honestly ask yourself those questions, then the answer should come back no. Don't, and it comes back yes. Then your action should be no. I'm not going to watch this for the sake of whatever uh, prohibited. Yeah. Define tenderness of conscience. Yeah. Uh, does it? Does it make you cynical, or, or does it make you, or does it obscure your, your, your view of right and wrong? Does it make you uh, justify bad action as a result? Or does it desensitize you to such things? Does it desensitize you to such things? Yeah, I think that'd be a good. Yeah, that does seem more like an opposite comparison to tenderness. Yeah. Say this is this is the reason why I ended up closing my eyes through half of the movie Deadpool, and I. We'll never watch that movie again because it uh, did that, it did that, and it did that. Uh, there were just so many little things in there that were just like, <sighs> and that's a personal thing. Uh, I would argue that I, I think that movie was so blatant. I don't think any Christians should really watch and enjoy it the same way I don't think any Christians should watch and enjoy porn. So that's practically what that movie was. <laughs> But uh, I'm open to arguments against it. But uh, anyway, uh, I think that's a good good litmus test it's a rule of thumb to go by. Like I said, it's by no means biblical or binding on all Christians, uh, but it's a good personal assessment for how should I behave, not sh how should he behave. This is all. Most of these, should someone do this, it's better to ask it of yourself than to ask it of your neighbor. Because when you start asking it of your neighbor, then you then you get into a realm of uh, comparison and judgment that is unhealthy. I digress there. Related to that, though, should Christians watch or support R-rated movies containing violence, foul language, and sex? Uh, I think this is a good question to ask. Is it right for Christians to support such movies? And I would argue quite often the answer may be yes. It is right for Christians to support and view and consume movies that contain those things. Uh, the question is, how are they presented? What is the message or point being made with those things? Is it sex for the sake of sex? Is it just to show, is it just to arouse, is it, is it in there intended just to increase the authority of the viewer's body over his mind? Or is it in there to make a point? 
is it in there to make a point about the fact that sex is a spiritual transcendental relation that knits two souls together uh, as designed by God uh, same thing with violence is it there to show that violence is a real thing that actually exists in the world that has to be dealt with and accounted for is it treating evil violence as evil uh, I think a movie that accurately depicts evil as evil is probably an okay movie to consume, assuming that you personally aren't affected by it on another level. If, uh, if viewing graphic evil violence does some of these things to you, I would say it's probably not best for you to watch or support that movie. It doesn't necessarily make it wrong. It's, it's a question of what point are they making. This is a view that, that I think many in the church would disagree with me and push back on and find with that. I, I am definitely... I can get along with Christians who say that we shouldn't support R-rated and violent movies uh, if they can get along with me. Uh, we'll just agree to disagree on this point. Uh, I think some of you in here share my feelings because we've talked about it previously. But uh, I do think those of you who are inclined to be on the more... Uh, yeah, of course Christians should be able to support and consume R-rated material and graphic and violent or sexual or foul-mouthed material. Uh, you should take another step back and make sure uh, what's, what's its purpose in that thing. Ask yourself why. Ask yourself why. Uh, is there a reason? Is, is, or is it just to revel in the gritty, the gritty grossness of it? In which case, it's usually probably a bad thing. And support isn't like supporting those things in the movie. It's supporting movies that may contain those things. Yes. Okay. Yeah, exactly. It's not necessarily saying, yes, let's get more violence in, in there. Example of this that I, think I, I point to sometimes is The Patriot. Patriot was my first R-rated movie. That's the first one I thought of. Yeah. Uh, it, is, it is violent, graphically so, in a few particular scenes. Uh, but it makes a very good point with the violence. It's showing, first of all, the the horrendous violence of what the the Revolutionary War was like, uh, and it also, in one particularly violent scene where uh, the main character goes and slays a whole bunch of British soldiers who just kidnapped his son, and they're taking him to be killed, right after they killed his other son. It's talking about the power of love and what's necessary to protect those you love. Uh, which is definitely reflected in the Godhead. Uh, and what God, what Jesus is going to do when he returns for the sake of those he loves really mirrors that scene pretty accurately. Uh, it was not as pretty hard in the movie, too. I think it was actually more well done than like, pretty hard. Yeah, I agree. Another one that people point to kind of on that point is, is uh, Saving Private Ryan. Oh, Opening scene of that movie is graphic. It is hard to get through. It is violent. But the purpose of that violence is to show just how awful D-Day was. Uh, you, and there's, there is, I think, a question of, of uh, can, we, can we show just how awful it was without being quite so disgusting? Like the end of 13 Reasons Why? Yeah, like the end of 13 Reasons Why. Uh, if you guys watched that show, which I don't recommend, it wasn't that great of a show. But if you do, watch it with your goggles on. Uh, but it was just like unnecessarily graphic uh, to make a point that really didn't need to be made. Uh, but I digress. I'd love to talk more, if you disagree with that assessment of 13 Reasons Why, I'd love to talk more about why I disapprove of it. Uh, what is the difference between a good movie and an effective movie? I think this is a question that, that should be asked. Uh, an effective movie, I think, would be like the, the short film that we watched in a heartbeat. I think that was a very effective movie. They, they effectively like, got their point across, exactly. whether it was right or wrong. And it's very, yeah, it's very compelling to people who watch it. Lots of people watch that movie and, and are persuaded towards the homosexual agenda because of it. Because it was a very effective movie. Doesn't mean it was a good movie. Uh, a good movie is an effective movie that promotes truth. Movie that effectively promotes good morality. Yeah. Uh, how should Christians talk about the movies they watch? I, th I think this is a. With extreme criticism. 
<laughs> criticism in the in the non-emotional sense of that word. Yes. Like, like analyzing it and and identifying its components and making judgments on whether or not they are biblical or non-biblical. And also with a degree of humility. There's a definitely and I, we saw it displayed in here and I'm guilty of it quite often of being quite dismissive towards people of different views and towards movies that promote different views. Uh, and I'm against that as Christians purely on the basis of effectiveness. Being dismissive of something without giving reasons is not as effective in convincing someone that they're wrong as being more kind and compassionate or tactful and giving the reasons. Uh, or dismissiveness or dis dismissiveness to a degree, but not to such a degree, a degree that it cuts off the lines of communication between someone who you disagree with. So, example, again, with that In a Heartbeat movie. Uh, when we first analyze uh, more gay propaganda, the idiots, can't believe they can't see it, uh, not as effective as saying, have you, have you thought about some of the components of this movie that might not be accurate? Let's talk about about whether or not love is a physical thing or if there's a spiritual component and what that spiritual component is. Uh, I, I think this movie wasn't that good because it doesn't accurately represent reality. That's, that's more, someone who disagrees with you about that movie will be more inclined to listen if you approach it that way. So I think Christians should talk about the movies I watch with a bit of tact. Uh, it's something I'm very guilty of and I have to work at of not being tactful that I express my views. And I would say many of the people in here are also guilty of. <laughs> so, uh, just a, a little check for us all. Any other final thoughts? I know I'm over time. I figured you guys didn't care too much. Okay. Batman scene. You guys want to watch the Batman scene? So yes. Yeah. Yes. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, actually, you know what? I think I have the movie. I don't think I deleted that one. this shot. Well, I was halfway to Hong Kong. You asked, I could have taken this passport. I told you to keep me in the loop. All that was left in the vaults for a month. They knew we were coming. As soon as your office got involved, my office. You're sitting down there with scum like Wurtz and Ramirez and you're talking? Oh yeah, Gordon. I almost had your rookie cold on a racketeering beat. Don't try to corrupt the fact that clearly Moroni's got people in your office, Dent. We need Lao back. The Chinese won't extradite a national under any circumstances. If I get him to you, and you get him to Tom, I'll get him to sink. Look, I'm going after the mob's life savings. See that sign is like, is like, it starts out far away, it gets closer, it's bringing them together, and it's like this, this weird like third party that's watching the conversation, and you, you're like, some, some, something is tense about this scene. And it's the fact that they did that shot that way. I think my connection is starting to slow down again. This is one of my favorite movies of all time. Christopher Nolan is my favorite director.